good morning, everyone. I'm Marshall Tannock, and with me is Lynn Jatellis. We are both attorneys. Uh, I'm with the law firm of Helmuth & Johnson. Lynn's an independent consultant. Uh, but we're not here wearing our attorney's hat today. Uh, we're here to talk about one of our favorite organizations, Beyond the Yellow Ribbon, or known as BTYR, BTYR Quad Communities. And the Quad Communities, not to be confused with the Quad Cities in Iowa, the Quad Communities are Golden Valley, Crystal, New Hope, and Robbinsdale. And both Lynn and I have been involved, Lynn, longer than I, in the organization now going on, uh, well, more than a year, uh, and going on two years uh, as this uh, organization has developed. But we're here to talk a little bit about the organization today, acquaint you with what we do, uh, tell you about some of our projects that we have done in the past, and some of the things that we plan to do in the future, and also would appreciate any kind of input, suggestions, ideas you might have for ways that we can uh, uh, broaden our services. Well, what are our services? Well, we'll show you on the next... Uh, Flash. Uh, what is the Yellow Ribbon? What's the Yellow Ribbon community? Well, a, a Yellow Ribbon community it, it is uh, an organization within our four communities that uh, works together to put the, to assist service members, military veterans, and their families. And uh, the organization sprung up in Minnesota. When I first became involved, I thought it was a national organization, and there are some national aspects to it. But the Beyond the Yellow Ribbon is rooted here in Minnesota. It's a product of some of the uh, hardworking folks who are concerned about veterans and their families developed here in Minnesota. Over, it, it started in 2008, and since that period, seven, almost seven years, there have been um, more than 200 and probably closer now to 250 organizations that have sought and obtained some type of yellow ribbon status. I'm sure, have you seen any of the uh, signs around the four communities in Golden Valley, Crystal, New Hope, and Robbinsville saying we are a yellow ribbon community? Mm -hmm. the yellow ribbon community? There are, uh, I think, four signs in each community uh, identifying us in the, uh, as yellow ribbon communities. Uh, the yellow ribbon uh, certification is not confined to cities like Golden Valley and Crystal and New Hope and Robbinsdale. It also consists of private and public sector businesses and organizations. For instance, Allianz and General Mills and the Minnesota Vikings and uh, organizations like that also are members of Beyond the Yellow Ribbon organization. So that's a little bit about what we do in a general sense. We'll talk about more specific programs that we have done in a moment. Um, I'm now going to ask Lynn, who really is critical to the organization, there's nobody who can, who's more important to this organization in terms of its founding and development and ongoing project management type of activities, as Lynn Jatellis, and Lynn is going to talk a little bit about where the uh, Yellow Ribbon uh, uh, pro uh, concept came from and how it's developed. Thank you. I don't really need that, but thank you. Um, I was brought in in July of now, I think it was 2012 or 2013, um, as a project manager. The cities, the mayors of the four cities had decided they wanted to become part of the Beyond the Yellow Ribbon community. I didn't even know what that was. Um, so I was on a learning curve to find out what this thing was that everybody was talking about. The National Guard um, of Minnesota had participated in the National Yellow Ribbon Project, which had been started by the, by the DOD, the Department of Defense. And the goal was to provide six months of support for service members returning from service in Afghanistan and Iraq. What they found after a while here in Minnesota was that six months wasn't nearly long enough. Issues continued to come up with families and funding and health care issues. And we needed more support for our veterans and for their families. So they came up with beyond the yellow ribbon. So it was beyond the six months. And the project was set up to focus on local communities so that a veteran would ha and their family would have ties in their community to people they knew who were willing to help them and work with them when they needed something that they didn't know how to get on their own. Um, we were, the, the four cities decided, the, the mayors decided, there was no way each city could do their own, but collectively we had enough resources to be able to pool those resources to help our veterans' communities. 
So we started out on a project team to do that. One of the first things we did was form what is known as a 501c3, a nonprofit organization. And the goal was to have a structure that would last, so that it wasn't just like a project team, and to, to make donations deductible for people who chose to donate to us. Everybody appreciates that, that uh, aspect of it. So we did that. We put together what's known as an action committee or a steering committee. People call them different things. And that's a group of people that each one of them has a specific responsibility, like organizing business community, organizing the healthcare community, the faith community. There are a number of those responsibilities. And those people are designed to work together to put on programming, and we're beginning to do that now. Um, and over the last year, we got our certification both as a 501, as a nonprofit, and we got our certification from BTYR as an organization um, with yellow ribbon designation. Um, what we're beginning to work on now is um, they're the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam Veterans War Association. And the Department of Defense, again, has said, you know, it's been 50 years and an awful lot of kids out there who don't really know much about it other than it's a history lesson. So the object is to provide education both to the community at large and to children in schools about what Vietnam was and what are all these people in the community who are Vietnam vets, what did they experience? Um, it's kind of a, an attempt to document what we never did after World War II, for example, when my dad came home. Um, the veterans came home and didn't talk much. And people really didn't know what they had experienced or what it was all about. And the goal now in this day and age is to try to make sure our veterans have that connection to their community and that the knowledge is ongoing. So that's our new project to work on. But that's the history of it. And we brought in Marshall as our president once we became a 501. And he gets to run our organization and helps direct what our next steps are going to be. Thank you, Lynn. We'll hear a little bit about the in a few moments. Um, the um, process by which we try to assist military veterans and their families is multiple. We don't do a lot of hands-on work ourselves. We're kind of a resource that provides assistance to families who are in need of veterans by trying to match them up with other uh, businesses or individuals or organizations that can help them. And I'll give some examples in a moment. One would think, well, why do we need this? Why isn't this organization, our organization, duplicating what the v Veterans Administration does? There's other, uh, uh, the VFW, the American Legion, the Wounded Warrior. There's all kinds of organizations that are geared uh, to helping veterans. But oftentimes, those are difficult to access. They don't necessarily act as quickly as sometimes are needed. And we'll talk about some of the emergency situations we have faced. And there's a lot of red tape and people get lost in the shuffle. What we're able to do, or at least what we strive to do, is to get assistance to people with as minimum of uh, paperwork and bureaucracy and try to do as efficiently and economically as we can. Um, and we try to connect them, and that's a key phrase, is connecting individuals and families in need with organizations that can help them before, during, and after their deployment. There is, as Lynn indicated, there is a process by which our cities, our four communities, as well as the various private organizations that I mentioned, and as I pointed out, there's more than 200 of them throughout the state, become an official yellow ribbon participant and get one of these neat little badges and certification. And um, as Lynn indicated, each community, each, each organization that seeks to be identified and certified as a yellow ribbon participant has to go through a process by which we identify problems in the area, what subject matters that need to be uh, addressed, as Lynn was indicating, faith, community, law enforcement, education, medical, and then uh, have to do basically an action plan and submit it to the certifying organization to show them that we uh, have a plan and we intend to implement phases of the plan. Uh, that process took a while. It took a lot of work by Lynn as a project manager and others, and I just want to mention a few others. We've had great support from the governing bodies of the four communities, 
the four mayors of their four respective communities, Jeff Harris in Golden Valley, Jim Adams in um, Bristol, um, uh, Kathy Hempkin of New Hope, and Reagan uh, of, of Murphy. Murphy, Reagan Murphy of Robinsdale have all been very supportive, as have council members. Uh, Julie Deschler, for instance, from New Hope, has done a, a, a lion's share of the work along with Lynn on many projects. And we have some military veterans who serve on our board and others in various capacities who do a lot of this work. And it's really spread out. We have a lot of support in the four communities. And we're not uh, engaged in any kind of competition here. We're trying to work together and coordinate these activities. Um, on the uh, next uh, slide, uh, these are some of the organizations that are involved as BTYR organizations. Uh, there's Business Radio, which is located in Gold Valley, as I said, General Mills, Allianz, Cup Food, Best Buy, Cargill, Wells Fargo, the Twins, the Vikings. These are some obviously big corporate uh, players, but smaller businesses are encouraged and invited to participate as well, and some do. And one thing that we're trying to do is broaden out our reach to smaller businesses as well, who we'll often get overlooked in these things. I think there's a tendency to go to the big businesses in the communities, the North Memorial, the General Mills, the Allianz, and they're, they're, who are wonderful organizations that participate in so many charitable activities. But oftentimes, there's smaller businesses who want to help, but they get overlooked. And we're trying to focus in on them, too. Um, the, uh, and, and more information is available about what you can do to, if you become a Yellow Ribbon supporter in our brochures that we have available for folks. Uh, to, you know, the brochures. Let's go to the next slide. These are, the brochures are available and they're fairly informative and we're in the process of perhaps updating them, but the brochures uh, tell a little, uh, tell the story of uh, uh, BTYR in much more detail than we can here today. But I urge people to contact us, and I'll tell you how you can do that if you want more information uh, about uh, our organization. We had a big uh, event on last summer, June 15th, which was our proclamation day. That's when we got our official certification, sort of uh, certified in, uh, uh, as a, an organization, uh, 501c3. We had Senator Frank in there, Congressman Ellison. We had the uh, Colonel from the Minnesota Air National Guard, Brian Weineken, and Annette Kuyper of the Minnesota Department of Military Affairs, who really is quite responsible for organizing the concept of BTYR and helping to develop it. And it was a quite nice presentation out at the uh, Crystal Airport and at the VFW adjoining it. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about what happened at that event. This was our program. VFW Post 4, uh, uh, 484 hosted us, and uh, this was what we did there. 494, I'm sorry. Um, next event. Uh, and here's a picture of some of the folks. Uh, here's the four mayors, three mayors actually. This is Mayor Adams, Mayor Harris, Mayor Hempkin, and a representative from the Robbinsdale City Council for uh, George Solomon, uh, uh, the mayor who couldn't be there. Uh, and here is uh, Ray. Uh, this is the colonel who gave a keynote address, and then Matt Kuyper, and they're giving us our official proclamation, which also was signed by Governor Dayton as well. And here's a little article from the uh, Sun Post about the event. As you can see, Senator Franken was uh, there and gave a very interesting presentation, an uh, uplifting one. And it was a nice event. There's the proclamation we received from the governor. And there's a certificate of recognition I received, although it's really not for me, and I, it should be for our whole organization. But the city, the city of Golden Valley gave a certificate of recognition to our group for the work that we have done. Uh, but it may be a little bit premature we, we, because uh, we've got a lot more work to do. <laughs> I think you know, we're not ready to, to rest on our laurels yet, okay? And uh, that's uh, Joan Klaus Klaus. of the Golden Valley City Council making a presentation to me, which I accept on behalf of our organization. Here's some, uh, here's uh, one, one uh, response we had from a spouse of a service member commenting upon what we have done. And um, um, here's an example. It's a small matter, relatively small, but it's very important to this individual. Here's an individual who, uh, woman was home with uh, her two kids, and she had a toilet problem. And she contacted us, and we were able to get someone out there real quickly, without cost, to help unplug that toilet. Not a big deal in the big picture, but real important on an individual basis. And those are the kind of things we do. I'll give you another example. 
we had the widow of a World War II serviceman who lived independently in her own house where they lived for many years here in, I believe that was in Crystal, or Robin, I think it was in Crystal, and um, she had a, a roofing problem, and she didn't have the resources to be able to, to repair her roof. And we searched around for her and matched her up with a company that was willing to do very low cost roofing services they just charged for supplies. So they basically re-roofed her house, repaired the roof on her house without charging her, and we were responsible for that. And I don't want to take a lot of credit, but the point is we matched her up and we found an organization that would come in and help her in her in time of need. And, these, and we get these kind of responses from people. We have a hotline um, that exists where people can contact us uh, and, and, and let us know that they have a problem. As I mentioned earlier, some of them are emergency problems. We've had situations where military veterans or family members or relatives are being evicted because they can't pay their rent or they're having problems maintaining their heat and uh, gas and heat for the winter because of some financial problem. They need immediate help. And oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes we're able to act on a, a relatively quick basis if they contact our hotline and we get on things pretty quickly. Um, here is um, some of the things we have Oh, those are the network. Yeah, this is the network. This is the network that the Minnesota National Guard has developed for helping uh, uh, military uh, veterans and their families in various ways. Family assistance, employment's a big issue, um, counseling, um, PTSD is a major problem, not only for recent veterans, but other veterans of other uh, conflicts as well. I ran in a, to a friend of mine from my days in high school a couple weeks ago. He's a Vietnam veteran. And uh, he was telling me about his experiences, and I hadn't seen him really since high school, since he was since he uh, was drafted right after high school. And uh, he is still uh, undergoing PTSD from Vietnam back in the 1970s. So we see those kind of ongoing situations, and we uh, and the National Guard network helps with that, and so do we. Okay. And uh, we'll take the next look at the next uh, slide here, and. Uh, Here's some more of the resources available. Employment is a is a, is a uh, ongoing issue. I'm going to ask Linda to comment a little bit about that because I know she's worked with it. One one request we see a lot related to employment and other matters like medical care is transportation. It it's a little bit surprising, I think, to me, and maybe that's because I'm not really attuned to that. That so many people have transportation problems. You think, well, people have cars and there's more metro mobility. And we're finding that many times veterans and their families need transportation to get to job interviews, to get medical services taken care of, to even be able to transport their kids around. Do you want to comment on that a little bit, uh, Lynn? Because transportation is a big issue. We, I, I, I haven't quantified this, but I'd say 20 to 30 percent of the uh, issues that come up that we address are transportation. I think what some people aren't always, certainly we weren't aware of either, as Marshall says, it surprised us. Um, as as people go off on deployment, sometimes their families move in with other family members while they're gone, they may or may not retain a vehicle. And they may or may not be able to maintain the vehicle while they're gone. And they come home and they've got a job interview 70 miles away. Well, you're not going to take a bus and you're not going to take a car. So you have to have you know, a cab, so you have to have your own car. So one request we get, there are two major requests. One is, I need a car to get to someplace. Um, and the other is, well, I have a handicap and I can't get into a regular car. Do you have a wheelchair or do you have an accessible vehicle? Um, these are ongoing requests and yes, Metro Mobility helps in the, in the metro area, but it doesn't do a lot of good once you're outside the metro area. And many of these families, even though we are in the quad communities, are looking for and finding jobs outside the metro area. Um, and going to interviews and going to medical appointments or going to see a specialist um, are an ongoing issue for us. If you know anybody who has any cars that they're not using, it would be good to hear about. <laughs> and we also are um, in need of people who can volunteer as drivers. I was contacted just last Saturday by someone who heard about our organization, asked how we can help, and I gave him some ideas that I'd like to drive for you. I told him about the transportation. He said, so we're always looking for volunteers to help in various ways. Um, let's go to our next slide here for a moment. And uh, this is a list of our personnel. Uh, as Lynn indicated, I'm 
titled as the president, but it's really a working group. Kurt Skoog, a veteran, is our vice president. John Ziba, also a Navy veteran, is a secretary. Mai Yi Yang is our uh, treasurer, um, and her or her uh, company devotes a lot of time and resources to helping us out. For free. <laughs> For free, without charge. Our board of directors consists of Julie Dashler, the city council person from, from the city of New Hope, Lynn, Shep Harris, the mayor of Golden Valley, Kathy Hemken, mayor of, of New Hope, and George Selman, whose picture you saw before, he's a city council member from Robinsdale, our legal advisor, and we have a lot of lawyers in this organization. <laughs> uh, Don Fernstrom was an attorney with the uh, Arthur Chapman Michelson firm, uh, provides uh, legal advice to us and also is uh, a key player, on, attends all of our important meetings, and Don then was instrumental in helping us go through the process of getting a 501c3 certification. And he's a Vietnam vet. And he's a Vietnam vet, yeah, Don's a Vietnam vet, as uh, John and, and Kurt are veterans too. Um, uh, and these are some of the people who have been on these project teams or steering committees. And they play different roles, but they've all been important and they've devoted their time selfishly. selfishly. Uh, and the four cities are identified here. Next uh, slide, we'll uh, talk about a little bit about donors. We are always, as any nonprofit organization probably uh, recognizes, uh, we're always uh, interested in seeking financial assistance and sometimes in kind assistance too. As Lynn indicated, providing a car or a vehicle or volunteering is a, is a form of donation. But uh, we uh, are always interested in uh, obtaining uh, financial support to help our programming. And we've had met a, a number of organizations who have done so. Here's the VFW Post 494. That's Jerry Thomas, the head of the organization. They made a very nice contribution <coughs> to us. Uh, uh, at, at, and I thank them at one of their meetings. We have the Freedom Riders in Golden Valley. And I'm going to ask Lynn to talk a little bit about that because that's Lynn right there. <laughs> the Freedom Riders. How come Lynn's picture always looks so much better than mine? <laughs> it's the photographer, not the, not the subject. Um, the Freedom Riders are a group of motorcycle riders from the VFW in, in Crystal. Um, but they presented, their, they, they did a ride just for us. It was about 300 miles total. And it was a very rainy, cold day, but they took off and they did it anyway. And they came back and gave us, what was it, $800 or something um, that they raised um, for riding for us. The, the VFW in Crystal has been absolutely magnificent, um, consistently. Um, unfortunately, as many of you may have heard, Golden Valley's VFW may or may not continue. They're not sure. The American Legion in Golden Valley has also been excellent support for us. This is where that was filmed, was at the American Legion at the Chesterbird um, headquarters down, in, down by Breck School. Uh, on Veterans Day, I gave a number of presentations uh, about the organization. Um, we, I spoke at the uh, Golden Valley Rotary, uh, and that's uh, Jeff Baylor, the president of Golden Valley Rotary, and Peggy Lepic. Many of you know Peggy. Peggy's a long time. Uh, Golden Valley activist and member of the state legislature, and uh, she's, uh, she invited me to speak to the Golden Valley Rotary, and I told them a little about our program. This is a no this is the Tri Cities Rotary. Golden Valley has its own rotary. The other three cities have a combined rotary. That's uh, Kathy Hempton, the mayor of uh, New Hope, and this is the president of the uh, 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 Tri City Rotary. Uh, and uh, I gave a little presentation there, and we lost it here. I want to talk a little bit about some of the uh, upcoming programs that we are looking to launch, and Lynn already mentioned one of them. The, uh, this year, in the next three years, has been recognized as the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War, which is somewhat imprecise because it didn't really have a, unlike World War II, with Pearl Harbor and VE Day, there's not a clear-cut start, uh, although I guess there is a clear-cut stopping point, but the Department of Defense has taken the occasion to recognize 1965 as sort of the starting point of the Vietnam War, and it certainly was. That was the first big step up of American troops. We had about 17,000 by the screen. before then. But so it's 1965 through 1967 is considered the height of the Vietnam War, but obviously it continued well beyond that. So organizations like ours have been asked uh, to uh, put on programs in the community, as Lynn indicated, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War. And as Lynn mentioned, we are working with schools in particular, not the exclusion of other organizations, and trying to programs which we call Vietnam Perspectives. 
the uh, plan is to have a number of different people who has some participation one way or the other in that war, and not just in the, in the, in the battlegrounds, but in other facets of that era. Uh, we certainly want a military veteran on a panel. Uh, we'd like some uh, individual from Vietnam who served in that er area, in, uh, in that era, and lived in Vietnam. We'd like to have a woman uh, nurse or someone in the nursing corps who has some medical experience who's in Vietnam. We also plan on having uh, somebody who is a, co a dissenter or an objector to the war because that's a major part. You can't talk about the Vietnam War just as a military exercise. You have to talk about it as a, an a, a, a an era. So we're planning on putting those kind of programs together with people in our, uh, in our quad communities. If you know of anyone who might fit that role, have them get in touch with Lynn or me, and we'll try to work them into our program. And that may be a program that we want to do right here for our Golden Valley seniors. I think it'd be very interesting to have four or five different people have different perspectives on the war, talking about the war, their experiences, and what we've learned about uh, ourselves and uh, how the country has changed because of the war. It's obviously a major issue. And as Lynn mentioned, one that often goes well below the radar for younger people, uh, especially students who just, uh, for them, it's just a, a paragraph or two in a textbook, and they have no appreciation for what uh, went on during that period of time. And historically, it's important, socially, culturally, politically, uh, it's an important era. And we're planning on doing something about it next year. Yes, no, it's okay. Uh, so that's one of our projects. As Lynn indicated, we have ongoing projects with military, assisting families on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's transportation, uh, housing needs. Uh, we provide uh, some support for people who need uh, assistance uh, in their own particular housing needs. We have uh, we had one situation with a woman who uh, Vietnam, uh, an Iraq veteran, who was quite disabled in, in, in that uh, in that conflict. And she needed some assistance with just taking care of her own house, housekeeping. She couldn't take care of her house very well, and we provided some housekeeping for her on an interim basis. Um, so that was that was a, a worthwhile and rewarding experience for us as well. Um, Lynn, what other projects are we looking at? We are looking at um, trying to integrate our medical uh, facilities a little bit better and connecting them up so that we can channel veterans to the right medical people at the right place at the right time. Anything else, Lynn, you want to comment on on some of our ongoing and prospective future activities? Well, some of the things we've talked about we haven't had the chance to act on yet. We would like to get um, our, our first responders together. Some of the, um, like the family assistance centers, have put on programs saying, well, gosh, if somebody suffers from PTSD, what do you expect to see from them? How would you deal with them successfully in an emergency? Because that, those are very often um, TBI, um, brain damage, and that's involved in behavior is not predictable. So they need to learn to work with that effectively. North Memorial has held more than one, um, and we'd love to them to do it again, along with courage, of course, on um, rehabilitation. And how do you work with families while this is all going on? How do you help families adjust to the changes that have come as a result of either injuries or PTSD or TBI. Um, education is kind of a new area for us. We're hoping really to break that in with the Vietnam program. Um, and we're looking at maybe even at doing some other things with uh, some of our community centers, like we have Golden Valley Days, which is now the Arts Festival, and having tables there for people to come up and learn about it, um, do some more outreach in, in the communities, work with our business communities like Allianz and General Mills, to do hiring fairs, um, and that, that's been very successful at Allianz, for example. We need to spread it out among the community so some of the smaller businesses participate as well as the big ones. That's kind of what we're working on for the next year, and then we'll see what we can take on after that, as, along with the assistance questions that come up as we go along. Let me just conclude with uh, our kind of going back to our roots. Where, people ask sometimes, where does the name come from? Why do we call ourselves Beyond the Yellow River? Many people, although not all, associate Beyond the Yellow Ribbon or Yellow Ribbon with a song from the 1970s. Does anyone remember what that was? Tie right. a Yellow Ribbon. Tie a Yellow Ribbon. Sung by the inimitable Tony Orlando. Orlando. And the name of his group was? Dawn. Dawn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, Tony Orlando was still around, incidentally. I was in Las Vegas recently at a family event, 
Uh, and he was playing in one of the casinos there with his new dawn. <laughs> so Tony's still around, and uh, we didn't go see him, but I did talk to someone who did see him. He said, yeah, he sings Beyond the Yellow Ribbon, and that's what people want. <laughs> so the term Beyond the Yellow Ribbon, the Yellow Ribbon the concept goes back many, many years as a wel way to welcome back or a way to remember military veterans while they're gone, uh, military uh, service people while they're gone, and then welcome them back to the community. Tony Orlando made that term uh, a catchphrase for returning veterans, honoring returning veterans, and we use that phrase to go beyond the Yellow Ribbon. And in fact, as we've hoped to, to uh, portray to you this morning, we've come a long way beyond the Yellow Ribbon, and we hope to continue on that path in the future. Thank you very much for your attendance and uh, your attention.